Armando, if you'd like it. Good to see you guys all today. It's uh, the years started off going like super slow, but now it's like in December has just been flying by, and Christmas is almost here upon us. Um, let us read here from first. This is First John, chapter four. I'm sorry, chapter one, one through four. So. Gospel, or not Gospel of John, the book of First John. Same writer as the Gospel of John. So First John, be towards the end of your Bibles. Um, chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard and proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The word of the Lord, amen. Now, if you were uh, around in Roman days, you would uh, went from a Roman kingdom to what was called the Roman Republic. I think I have a slide there, Eric, if you could press that up there. And the Roman Republic... You might know that term. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands, right? We use that term. So we think of ourselves as a democracy, but a republic is a representative democracy. Think of electoral college, all these things that cause controversy today, right? This idea that uh, someone else will represent the people. So uh, they deposed of their king and said, never again will we be ruled by a king. We have a republic, and these senators would um, ultimately stand and and vote as the people wanted, or that was the idea. I don't know why it didn't work for them. It works perfect today, but they didn't have their stuff together, I guess. You know, like today we all say, hey, our our representatives always represent us perfectly and accurately. So what happened in the Republic was, uh, unfortunately, uh, corruption started to creep into the Senate. So they had a Senate, which was largely based, or, or our Senate, or kind of the House and the uh, House of Representatives and the Congress, we call it, was largely based on that Roman model. There would be two kind of uh, phases or houses there within the Senate, and they would vote similar to how we vote uh, today. So the Senate had the power. There was no ultimate uh, dictator or president, if you will, Uh, and there there always was, you know, a leader. There always uh, was a Caesar, as we call them, but... Uh, Not with absolute power, not with absolute authority. The authority was supposed to be ultimately in the Senate and represented by the people. And so as time went on, as I said, the politics became corrupt. Another factor is they needed tax money, something we have plenty of today. You guys are probably all getting stimulus checks, but eventually that runs out, and they were running out of money. And thirdly, they had societal unrest. They didn't really have a uh, police force to defund, so they had to kind of create their own uh, private police forces. So those who are wealthy kind of hired private security guards, and uh, those who didn't just were kind of open to being mugged or robbed. And sometimes if somebody else's security force was stronger than the other guy's security force, you could actually take and take their stuff as well. Now, there always is... There were courts of law, and if somebody obviously getting too crazy, you know, the army could step in, but kind of this low level, kind of what we, t- you know, mugging or purse snatching of things that we think of today, right? You know, calling the military to handle those type of things. And so there's just a lot of unrest. People are unhappy. There's, there's fights breaking out in the streets. Think of it kind of today, maybe as uh, Iraq or going into certain parts of Mexico, right? You don't want to be there after a certain time because you could be innocent, but be caught up in a skirmish between two sides. 
And so there's this guy named Julius Caesar. Anybody ever heard of him? This is around 40 years before Christ. If you haven't heard of him, then you forgot your history because he was a very prominent figure. Uh, the Roman emperor and who is kind of seen or credited with taking Rome from a republic to an empire. So when we talk about the Roman Empire, we're really talking from Julius Caesar on. And so the Senate saw Caesar here, who was a, a military general, a very good military general, and he went and he won, and the Senate said, okay, uh, release your troops and come back. Well, Caesar released some of his troops, but he kept a regiment with him and marched across the Rubicon, which many saw, and that was a river, that, so many saw that as a sign of war. He's not going to relinquish his power. And so civil war broke out, and Caesar and his side won, and he declared himself emperor. The Senate, which was still in power, he didn't come in and say, I'm sole dictator and I'm doing away with the Senate. But that's what was feared. If Caesar wins, if Caesar wins the presidency or emperorcy or whatever we call it, right? the, the idea is that Rome is done. There's no coming back. The Republic is over. And so the Senate devised a plan. And that plan was they would call Caesar to the Senate meeting and they would stab him. And here's a picture. I don't know if it looked exactly like this, but all the senators said they all had to be a part of it because otherwise, you know, if it was blamed on some and not others, then the people could turn against those that killed them. So the senators turned on Caesar and stabbed him 23 times, and he died. And this was one of the first known autopsies, uh, and there was in ancient history, and they said only one of the stab wounds was fatal, one that hit his aortic artery, one to the neck. And uh, so this was a big thing in history, right? We have the start of, uh, of revolution in Rome. We have autopsies. We have the Senate, uh, you know, taking out the leader. I mean, we've seen those arguments in British, in those British parliaments, how they get real angry and yell at each other. Have you guys ever seen that? If not, like, Google that, YouTube that, like, you know, British Senate arguments. And these guys, like, yell at each other and scream at each other, right? But this is much worse, right? Now there's, like, stabbing people, right? So can you imagine, you know, you're, like, watching the uh, uh, annual address, what's that, of the State of the Union, you know? And then you see senators run up and try to start stabbing the president. That would just be unprecedented. That would be chaotic, right? Uh, the biggest chaos you could ever dream of. And that's really what we see happen here in Rome. Now, after Caesar is killed, uh, you can put the next slide up. Is there one there? There we go. Um, <clears throat> the, his son, by the name of Caesar, Augustus, takes power. And this is kind of one of the weird ironies of history in that the Senate had fully anticipated that taking out Caesar would lead back to the good old days, to the republic, to uh, the power. So they had to take out Caesar, because if Caesar got in, then the republic was over. But what happened is, and there's debates in his history over really if Caesar was going to fully be this monarch, his, his top general, Mark Anthony, came to bring him a, cr a crown just a month prior and tried to put it on his head, and he refused it. I don't want to be rex or king, he says. So some say... He didn't want to undo the republic. He just wanted to bring order. There was no society. There wasn't order in society. There's riots and muggings and, po and poverty. The economy's bad. All these So he just was trying to bring order, and the idiot Senate took him out. You're right. Um, but the irony here is that these senators were trying to save the republic by killing him, and what it did was rather than save the republic it ultimately doomed it because his son Caesar Augustus comes to power and declares himself emperor in the fullest extent. And the term Augustus here isn't his last name. Augustus was a religious title. So he's no longer just emperor. He's now emperor priest, if you will. That's not what the term means, but it's, it's this 
term of, of high endearment, but it would, it would be that. It would, it would basically picture Trump in the Oval Office saying, I am now president and pope. Call me P and P, right, you know? It, it would be outrageous, right? Uh, what? You're, you're now not only the president, but the religious leader? And so, you know, for all their plans and intended consequences, it didn't work out to save Rome or to save the Republic. In fact, it backfired and gave even more power to the emperor and less to the Senate and less to the people. Now, this is the context and time in which Jesus comes on the scene. We have an early picture here of uh, Mary and Joseph. This was taken on, I think, the first iPhone, so it's kind of blurry. But uh, there is this, this uh, census that goes out. In the time of Caesar Augustus, the book of Luke tells us. We won't turn there for time's sake, but you guys know the story. Jesus is coming in, and Christmas Eve, we're going to be here Thursday. We're going to read a lot of these stories. Uh, so come. We'll be here 8 p.m. for that. Um, but this, this uh, edict goes out, or this edict to do a census goes out. And censuses, if you don't know, they're not just to have accurate population numbers in our time or theirs. They do want accurate population numbers, but they want them for the purpose of taxation. Okay, so we want to know who to tax, especially in this era. In our time, it's largely for representation purposes, how many electoral votes each state gets, so on and so forth. But, and there was some of this type of idea going on then, too. But the idea is you've got to know who's alive so you know who to tax, so you know how much money you have to run the empire. And so each person is, was forced to kind of go to their place of birth um, and, and register. So Mary here is traveling pregnant, um, and it leads us to the story of why they have to have Jesus on the road, so to speak, right? And why we hear that uh, they stop, and there's no room for them in the inn because they're on this, this mission, if you will, to go and register in the census. Now, if I told you guys, you know, I said, hey, uh, Joseph, you've got to drive to L.A. to go register for the census. Today's day and age, you're like, heck, I ain't driving all the way out there. But, uh, you know, they, they had a little worse consequences when you didn't follow through back then. But the idea is that you'd have that type of journey, but not in a car, but on a donkey. So that would be a long walk, right? I mean, you kind of pull, you, you'd have to walk, but she'd have a mule to ride. And if you're wealthy, perhaps you could ride on a horse. Even that, right? I can only imagine if we had to take a, ride a horse all the way to L.A., uh, how tired we'd be, how sore we'd be the next day. Has anybody ever been horseback riding? You know, like you just do that little pony ride, and you're like, thighs are sore the next day. Like, wow, how'd they do it back in the day, right? You know? But this is where Jesus um, comes on the scene. And this glorious or inglorious, however you want to view it, Roman Empire, this empire which would rule the world, right? And had ruled the world, or... or at least the Western world, most of it. Uh, and as they say, a thousand years. That's, that's, that's kind of the uh, pop phrase, right? Rome ruled the world for a thousand years. Now, of course, they didn't have, they didn't rule every square inch, and there were other countries fighting them, so on and forth, so forth. But they were the superpower, kind of how America has kind of been looked at as a superpower for probably since World War II, you know? And then if some people would say, you know, they go from our founding in 1776, you know, and say, we've been this superpower for 300 years. But that was Rome for a 1,000. And really, as I said, our power really only comes on maybe after War I and World War II. So Rome was around for a long time. They were a dynasty of dynasties, if you will. And as we think about that, of Christ coming in to a Roman world, a hostile world, not only, as we're going to see, to his own, to the Jews, but to one of the superpower of world history, if you will, that ruled and dominated the world. And ultimately, he's born into this context, proclaiming his kingship, his dynasty, if you will. And... This is why when we look at um, the text here, 
And, 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 and John is telling us, you know, that which was in the beginning. He's referencing back to the, the book of John, the gospel of John. If you remember, John 1.1 1, 1 starts off saying, in the beginning was the, the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things that were made were made through him, and without him, nothing was made. And so it brings back the source of creation, if you will, the source of eternity, of God. That Christ, in the beginning, is with God, co-eternal with the Father. As Ray read uh, a lot of what he read today, is you know, tying right into this. And, and in 1 John here, now he's kind of giving a personal summary of this theological concept that he had spelled out in the Gospel of John. And that is that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So he's saying, look, we heard it. This isn't a concept. This isn't a religious story. This isn't uh, Roman mythology or Greek mythology. This is the message from God, which we have seen, which we have heard and which we have looked upon and touched and he calls it here the word of life. So in, in the Gospel of John, it's just referred to as the word. And the word would be a loaded term. Not We just think of a word that we speak out or maybe that we write. But this term word in, in the Hebrew or Greek sense is, is one which is this power, this creative force. Even as some would say the logic or reason, the, manifest, the manifestation of, of God's power. Because remember, God spoke the world into existence, right? He speaks and he creates. And so this word is a creative force. And some, some churches and, and, and uh, people have kind of went crazy with this kind of concept and, and say we can do the same thing, right? And they'll say just, cause, just as God spoke things into existence, so can we. Because words have the creative power and force. And so speak to your wallet. Pull it out and say, get money in my wallet, you know, get money in their wallet, you know, or get w- wallet, get money in there. And t- tell your, you know, your, your bank account to grow. And, and you speak to it like that. And that's how you create wealth. And that's how you create these things, right? And so what they're missing there is we as humans, we speak. But man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. We have no power to create anything in and of ourselves. It's only God who has a creative force and power. And this creative force and power and wisdom of God is manifest here in Christ Jesus. The word of life, as he says here. This word that gives us now life. So Christmas here is is a season. It's joyous. It's festive. It should be, right? Hopefully. Hopefully that's how we're making it. But Christmas is profoundly a doctrinal Season, a doctrinal statement, a doctrinal theme. We, sometimes doctrine, you know, when you say the word doctrine, that can almost be like a, a bad word, right? But the idea is that there's something being proclaimed here that's not obvious to all. There's something being proclaimed that is revelational and revolutionary. That the word of life was made manifest, that we have seen it. And as John says here, that we proclaim to you the eternal life. The eternal life is in a person. Eternal life isn't a concept. Eternal life isn't something we get after we die. Eternal life is in a person, and God brings us into that person. This is what largely we mean when we talk about, especially in Reformed theology, is covenant, right? The idea that we're in union. We're in communion with God, with, through, through Jesus Christ. We're brought into eternal life through trusting in the gospel, through trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's why at the end, uh, you know, he'll say that you may have fellowship. He talks about this word fellowship there in verse 3. That you too, you too, just like him, just like John the Apostle, that you too may have fellowship 
with us, with the apostles, with John, with God's people. Because his fellowship, as he says here, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's a profound thing, right? To understand that we can have fellowship, just not with people, but that our fellowship is with God. And often that fellowship with God is manifest through his body, through the people that God has established and put around us. That's why the scripture talks about different gifts, and one has a gift of that, and one has a gift of this, to encourage this, so on and so forth. And we don't have time to get into the doctrine of gifts, but the idea is that God brings us together to be his people, to be a kingdom, for he is indeed our true king. So Christmas ultimately, and this isn't a traditional Christmas passage, right? But the idea here is that, that Christmas is really about the incarnation, this doctrine of the incarnation, God come down, manifest, made flesh, being born, living a perfect life in our place, going to the cross for us. But the beauty of the cross, or of the story of Christ, or the story of of really his birth here as we celebrate in Christmas, is the reality that it's not only doctrinal, but that it's historical. The Christian faith is not based on myths or ancient stories or uh, what is what is a phrase today you know uh, good vibes and thoughts has anybody ever told you that you know i'm sending good vibes your way what does that mean you're like two thousand miles away right you know, how do you send me good vibes you know Some, sometimes they used to, we used to say like our thoughts and prayers are with you i don't know what the thoughts parts do but you know usually our, well i went from our prayers we'll pray for you to our thoughts and prayers are with you and to our our thoughts and Good energy is with you, however it's phrased. Um, but the, the, so this reality that that the incarnation has come down is historical, and the reality is that the invisible has been made visible, the intangible has been made tangible or touchable. No one has, no one can know God, right? That's what John says. No one has seen God. No one knows His mind. Except, as Jesus revealed, the Son, which reveals to us the Father's will. And we have that revelation through his word. And so the word of God reveals the word of God, being that word in John there, two different, two different Greek terms, right? But this written word of God reveals this power and wisdom and creative uh, fullness, if you will, of God's work. And so much of, of, you know, when we think of religion today, is really this debate between God's kind of transcendence or his eminence, how close he is. So in Eastern religions, say Buddhism, you know, we say, well, we're Christians and, and we follow the way of Christ. And people say, that's, that's great. Jesus was a great moral teacher, right? But for them, religion and God is very out there. It's very transcendent. Who could, we don't see God, we don't touch God. It's just a concept that floats out there. Uh, and for others, uh, it's, it's very eminent. Like, God's on all of us, man. You know, like, I feel God on the wind. He's eminent, man. When, when I go to that sports game and see my player throw that touchdown, I feel God in that moment, right? You know, so people have these bizarre interpretations of, of what God is and what he's doing, and he's in all of us, and we're in him. And, and so all, the, you know, all religions basically break down to a debate over, is God eminent or is God transcendent? And Christianity's answer to that is ultimately he's both. God is both other than but yet eminently involved in our lives. In the Roman world, in Julius Caesar's time, pagan religion is based really on this idea of the gods are just like you and me, except they're powerful. In fact, go back to that uh, slide there. What's uh, on Augustus there? Yeah, so, yeah, we can go to the birth there. Go to that birth scene. So Jesus is born here in a lowly manger. But when we're talking about Rome, we're talking about this isn't how kings look and you know, we don't know that's exactly how it looked but the idea there is that right that, that that's not a powerful scene it's not a palace but this is what Ro- roman gods were basically just like you and me except they were they had a really jacked up sense of humor and they had a lot of power 
if you will. And I guess that comes with power. When you power, people tend to do jacked up things, I guess, right? Absolute power corrupts absolutely, as they say. But so, the, so, the, so Roman religion wasn't to make you more moral or more loving or more caring or make society better. Religion was about uh, doing what the gods wanted you to do, so they granted you power and victory over your enemies. Okay? So, and that's most religions, tribal religions, even to this day, you go into, you know, certain lands and it's about doing a certain act to get God's favor. Sometimes Christians even, you know, people that claim to be Christians sometimes think like that. I'm going to pray so I get this good job. or I'm going to pray so, you know, I get this girl. I'm going to pray so I get rich. And so they're using God in very much a pagan kind of way. Not saying, God, I want to know you. God, draw me close to you. God, reveal yourself to me. Lord, tell me the true meaning of Christmas so that I don't spend all my money on presents, right? Those aren't our prayers. It's to make us strong, to make us powerful, to make us have victory, to make us win, right? Um, and so, in, 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 in ultimately, in the pagan Religion and in most religions, right? The concept of holiness is not there. The concept of the spirit's empowerment is, is, is not there. But that's ultimately what we see here in this lowly manger, this, this, this antithesis to that narrative, to power, is humility and weakness. And Christianity isn't spread by power or by the sword or by having the most uh, votes or the biggest uh, army. It was spread by sacrifice, by love, even by martyrdom. Go to the next slide. We, we see that uh, a few years, about two years after Jesus' birth, and just to touch on this briefly, three wise men came. We could do a whole sermon on who they were and how they got there and what everything meant that they did. But uh, the, the point is that they followed the star. And Natalie said it's coming tomorrow. The star is coming again. This, this solar uh, phenomenon. So, so I guess they're, they're calling it the Christmas star. right? It comes once every 800 years. And many of you think maybe this is the star that God used to reveal uh, Jesus' birth. And uh, if you go on YouTube, a lot of people are saying this is the star that's going to signify you know, Christ's return or the you know, end of the, uh, uh, the age or what have you. right? And so people get into all types of uh, bizarre things from the stars or from you know, adding up certain names. COVID equals 666, all these different things, right? But remember, the point here is not to say they were just making something out of nothing. God reveals, so there can be natural phenomenon, just like God parting the Red Sea, right? But not every tidal wave or phenomenon that would be out of the ordinary is a miracle or is God-ordained. But as God reveals it, then we know it to be true, just like we have dreams. It doesn't mean every dream is a message from God to say, this or that, right? God would have to make that clear. And that's why we call it miraculous, because it's out of the ordinary. But put up the next slide. These three wise men bring to Jesus three gifts. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm going to quote Origen here as an early church father in the second century. He mentions what he interprets and what many have interpreted to be the meaning of the gifts. That gold as to a king, myrrh as to one who was mortal, and incense as to a God, because these are, in ancient times, what these things would symbolize. And so, was that the, no, there's, one, there's only one slide after that, right? So keep that there. So the idea that here, though, is that I bring this up, is that these wise men are put in the story for a reason. And it's not to make us wonder about what that star exactly was, or what the next one means, or where they came from, because the scripture leaves all that out. It wants us to focus on these Three wise men, or kings, or however, again, we have different names and debate who they were and their significance, but the point is that they came, God revealed to them that they would come, that they would worship Christ here as king by giving him gold, but yet understand his humanity by, by myrrh and yet his divinity from the fact that incense was given. This would ultimately be not only in Jewish religion, but in many religions, incense was this the thing that we use in temples to their deities. Um, and so 
These are meant to signify for God's people who and what Christ really is. And as I said, he uh, is not just, as some people say, you know, our God or our Lord, our Savior. He's all those things. But he's also Christ, our King. That's ultimately what Messiah or the name Christ signifies, this anointed one. He would be anointed with the seat or the crown of David. So we sometimes use Greek and Hebrew terms and don't really understand. You know, Christ isn't Jesus' last name or Messiah isn't, you know, his middle name. They're titles, they're terms. He's Christ, the king, the true king, the king above all other kings, including Caesar, including, as we saw, King Herod in the Bible, who tries to kill him. He's kind of a lesser king. The Bible doesn't explain all these, but it's, you know, the emperor would kind of set up kind of like governors, right, or or figureheads in certain areas to run things. And so this is why Herod tries to kill Christ or kills all the children under the age of two because he sees him as a threat to his kingship. And not just to his, because he dies long before Christ is old enough, but to his lineage. It would kind of be like, you know, the Democrats going and trying to kill off all the Republicans. Like, I don't want that lineage to ever come through here. Or all the Republicans, were, we're going to take out all these liberals so they never come to ruin America again. Right? And th- this is the thinking. Right? We're going to keep someone from taking not only my power, but my family's power, or my party's power, or my group's power. So this, ultimately this, this message we see here of Christ as king is... is is amazing because it trans it just goes against everything we we think of the normal ways of looking at the world so the gospel as as we see it here is is god comes down right that he not just came to earth though cuz sometimes we get stuck there that's so great that's such a loving story that jesus put in the manger right it's so it's not just that he came to earth to tell us how to live Although he does say, follow in my footsteps, right? But he doesn't just come here to be a good moral teacher or to set a good moral example. Um, And if we follow that morality, that God will bless us. That's sometimes how we look at, at at our faith or at God. But the gospel is ultimately that Jesus Christ came to the earth, lived a perfect life that we should have lived, and died the death we should have died. The judgment that was put on Christ for our sins is really what was owed to us. The punishment of hell was ultimately placed upon Christ on the cross. And this is why when we say we accept Jesus or we believe on Jesus, what, what we're ultimately saying is we're accepting his work. We're accepting his kingship that he came, he suffered, he died, he lived morally and righteously before God because this is what the true God requires. Not power, not just uh, take over, not just, uh, he's not a person with passions and thoughts like us. Rather, he's transcendent or other than. He's holy. He's set apart. But yet to be imminently involved in our life, he sent Christ to take on human flesh to live our life, to go to the cross, and ultimately, that as we believe in him and trust in him and are in covenantal communion with him, he sends his spirit upon his people. Again, not for shows of, of displays of, of power and great feats and uh, you know miraculous signs that, that wow everyone, but the spirit's power is to enable us to live a holy and contrite life that we could follow in the footsteps of Christ. Because displaying, people through natural means can do some amazing things. They can make some amazing catches in sports. They can do some amazing feats in lifting or marksmanship. But what no one can do is live faithfully unto God, right? Without sin, having every thought taken captive to God, living their life at every moment 
in a pleasing way to God. This is what we're powerless to do. This is what we call sin. And this is really the depravity of sin, is that sin corrupts everything that is good. And this is the importance for us to grasp, guys, that guys and girls and children, is that we grasp the world around us isn't so much evil as it is tainted. So when we look at the world, right, we see government. Government's not evil. Some would say, yeah, we need to overthrow it all. It's all evil. But government has been tainted by sin. You know, people will say, man, men are evil. Or women are just evil. Man, they're so conniving. Men are evil and women are evil. They're just tainted by sin. You know, so marriage ends in divorce. It's tainted by sin. It's not marriage. It's evil. I hear people say to me all the time, I'm never getting married again after what that woman did to me. Right? Or I'm never going to get married again after what that... I, I've, all this, you know, I've been married three times and every guy cheated on me, so I'm done. And the, the problem isn't marriage. The problem is the sin in the person's heart. So everything we see around us, right? Even the relationships of husband to wife, wife to child, child to pet, are all tainted by sin, right? None of us follow and love perfectly and uh, are able to manifest God's will perfectly. And this is ultimately why we need a perfect Savior. And we need to trust in that perfect Savior and why we need to proclaim Him not, Christ not just as Savior, but as our King, and that our loyalty thus is towards Christ as King. First and foremost, our identity, we've talked about this before, right? Isn't in that great, uh, you know, sports team that uh, is supposed to make our joy complete by uh, winning a Super Bowl or winning a World Series? In fact, that last phrase, let's read that in verse 4 here. And we are writing these things so your joy may be complete. Now, if you're a California sports fan, 2020 has been a great year. We had an NBA championship won. And what else, Leah? What else did we win in L.A.? The Dodgers won the World Series. I know Leah's been praying for that for the first 11 years of her life because that's what her dad told her to pray for. But the point, Leah, is that you're probably not any happier today because the Dodgers won the World Series, right? I mean, you might have been happy the day after they won, but that probably hasn't carried over. Nobody walked into church today like, thank you, Lord, the Dodgers are still the world champs, right? Or my, you know, 2020, I don't care how many people died. I don't care about like, everything being shut down. The Dodgers won. No, it doesn't work like that, right? And so we look to other things that make our joy complete. You know, our, our, our favorite sports team or our presidential candidate or governmental candidate or local candidate, whatever it may be, uh, winning uh, we look to maybe getting in that relationship we want to get in. If I meet that right girl, it'll make me happy. Or maybe that right house. Or get that right interest rate right now because mortgages are low. All these things so we get happy. So we get joy. Because if we just have a little more, we'll be content. But ultimately, uh, to put the last slide up there, we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. And that picture there of Christ in the manger uh, is really symbolizing where our joy should be, not just in the manger, per se, but in Christ, this story of Christmas, of what and all it represents. That John writing this letter to the believers, wanting them to understand the manifestation of the incarnation, the gospel message, this message of love and sacrifice over and against the message of power of the world. And so as Christians, we're not saved by how we live and what we do. But we should understand that this gospel message is powerful. And when we call Christ King... That there's a call to that. Just like when you say you're a sports fan, right? You don't put on the other team's hat. You know? When you say you're a certain political party, you don't vote for the other person. Well, that happened a lot this year. But the idea is you're supposed to be loyal, right? And when you're not loyal, then everybody hates you. You're a bandwagon fan. You switched because uh, 
this, your team lost and this team won. But many Christians go through as bandwagon Christians, if you will, because they're trying to get on some train or some bandwagon, right? So that's an old term. We call it a train now. But the idea is that we're trying to get on some wagon that's better, some train that has more. The lust of the world, the pride of life, the, you know, the commercialism, the money, whatever it may be, we're looking for our joy in those things. And that's why I say we're bandwagon, because our joy is ultimately put in the person of Christ. And the fellowship he's made manifest is... John says here that we have fellowship with God and you have fellowship with us and we have joy in that reality that we are indeed in Christ's kingdom, that we're his people in his kingdom. That should make us rejoice. That should make us running out of here, jumping up and screaming for joy because of who and what, well, who we are, and, but what we, we're who we are because of what God has made us and what God has called us to. And so we don't wait for, like I said, a team to win a championship or our candidate to win or for us to hit the lottery. All those things will bring us no more joy. They might have temporal happiness, but our, when we understand who Christ is, when we understand what he's done for us, and when, he, when we understand how he's made us into, as Revelation calls us, a, a, a kingdom of priests, right, that... Uh, we indeed are made holy and able to commune with the one true and living God. And we're able to love our neighbor and even our enemies by the power of the Spirit. So let us take that message uh, into this next week of Christmas. Let us pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, and so many things in our minds, so many, so much to do, so much to say, so many places to go. So many things that take our focus off of you. But Lord, I pray that we wouldn't fall into the same trap of the world. That we wouldn't fall into the trying to solve things and work things out ourselves in our own way with our own plan. But that we would just trust in you that we would ultimately look to the story of Christmas and help us understand its significance. Help us trust that you have indeed made eternal life manifest to us and that we have fellowship with you and we have fellowship with each other and help us to rejoice in that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.